So, Tor, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on. So there's something that bee-loving people really like to say, and I love the sound of, and that is that bees are responsible for every third bite of food that humans consume. But in your book, you have a decidedly foodie way of illustrating what that actually means. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Yeah, well, that statistic comes from looking at global crop production and the fact that, you know, fully 35 percent of that production either relies on or benefits from bee pollination. But mm. I thought it would be interesting to look at the quality of food, not just the quantity, and try to mm. dissect a meal looking for bee ingredients, but not just any meal, not just something that you would see at the farmer's market or the produce aisle, but something a little bit out of the way of the normal bee foods, and that was a Big Mac sandwich at McDonald's. <laughs> um, and what I found was that you know there were a host of bee products involved in that hamburger. Things like pickles and even the lettuce and the onions get removed uh, and you still have a burger, you still have a, a meat patty from grass and grain-fed beef, and you can still have a bun from wind-pollinated grains, uh, but the sesame seeds had to be picked off the bun, and <laughs> even the special sauce had to go. I started looking at the ingredients, and you have a host of things in there, at least five ingredients that relied upon bees from the paprika to the uh, vegetable oils that give it its rich taste and texture. Hmm. Uh, so the lesson that it taught me, Francis, was that, yes, we could eat in a world without bees, but our food would be pretty dull and probably not very nutritious. Yeah. It goes from to all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickle, onion, on a sesame <laughs> seed bun, to like a sad burger. Yeah. The <laughs> jingle would never have caught on, you know, it would, yeah. to all beef patties <laughs> bun. That doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so bees give us a lot, but in the book you argue that there's more. Right? It, it almost sounds to me that pretty much everything we like in the plant world is because of bees. Well, the one thing to remember right off the bat is how diverse bees are. We tend to immediately think of honeybees, but we're talking about a group that has more species than all the birds and all the mammals combined, and then some, over 20,000 oh, wow. species of bees in the world. Yeah, and that diversity stems in part from their close relationship with flowers. Bees and flowering plants co-evolved together, the diversity of one mm. spurring diversity in the other. And because bees are solely reliant upon flower products for their own food and for the food they feed to their, their babies, the little larvae there back in the hive or the nest, they want that nectar and that pollen, and from the plant's perspective, they want to attract bee visitors to move pollen among flowers. You have this interesting coevolutionary relationship where each side influences the other. And flowers mm. that we look at uh, have adopted colors specifically to attract bee visitors. So many of the colors that we think of, you know, for flowers, the blues and the purples fall right in the middle of the bees' visible spectrum. And that is by design. That is what the flowers have uh, evolved to do is attract those bees in with the, not only the colors, but the smells and the shapes of those flowers, all designed to attract and then manipulate the bees on the flowers so that they move in a particular way that uh, deposits pollen uh, onto the bee and then removes that pollen onto the female parts of the flower uh, or the next mm. flower that the bee visits. So a lot of what we see in nature and take for granted is actually heavily influenced by bees. Oh, that's wild. So if there were no bees, what would flowers look like? Like, or what would they smell like if they didn't have to attract bees? <laughs> well, then you have to start looking at what some of the other flower visitors are out there. So if we get rid of bees, the flowers would uh, be much more likely to have co-evolved with other insects like wasps and flies, for example, who are attracted to these musky terpenes and, and rotten flesh smells, you'd have all these dead meat-looking flowers out there. And there are a few <laughs> examples of that. 
uh, in nature where the flowers uh, look and smell like rotten meat to attract, uh, say, flies of particular kinds for pollination. Uh, but they're quite rare because the bees are a much better bet. So it is a happy accident in nature that the smells and the colors and the shapes that we find beautiful are, are the ones that are attractive to bees as well. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, you're again, you're talking about flowering plants. And I think it's so important for us to remember that flowering plants aren't just flowers, like pretty flowers, like tulips, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, most of the fruits and vegetables that we eat are actually flowering plants, right? Like oranges flower, apples flower, zucchini flower. Exactly. Huge range of things that you would see in the produce aisle and some things that are less intuitive, even nuts. I mean, every almond that oh, you wow. get in a bunch of, of mixed nuts there, that seed uh, comes from a flower that was visited by a bee. It has to be bee pollinated. And things that are far less intuitive, like vegetable oils. When you think of canola oil, uh, those are from mustard plants with big, you know, beautiful yellow flowers visited and pollinated by bees, and even some things like soybeans, which can self-pollinate, uh, do much better if bees are present in those fields. Ten to forty percent higher yields for bee-visited soybean flowers. Yeah. So I want to ask you about a chapter in your book where you talk with a nutritional anthropologist, because this is a conversation that totally blew my mind, and she thinks we owe bees some credit for actually helping us evolve into humans. Yeah, this is terrific stuff. It really is. When we talk about the human connection to bees, we often think of you know our long domestication of honeybees or, or even uh, looking for wild uh, honeybee nests and other bees in nature. So back you know thousands of years. But but this anthropologist, Alyssa Crittenden, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and colleagues that she works with have done some fascinating research and suggest that our connection to bees should be measured in the millions of years. And what they've done is uh, study the dietary habits of the Hadza people, a hunter-gatherer group still living a very traditional hunter-gatherer subsistence lifestyle in East Africa, in the very mm -hmm. landscape where our species is thought to have evolved. And okay. in doing so, they learned how much honey those people eat. Not just honey, but also the larva uh, and the pollen that's included in those honeycombs. Uh, we tend to think of that something like that as sort of a sweet occasional treat. But in interviewing people and observing the foods brought back to those camps at the end of a day's foraging, Alyssa was able to calculate how many of their calories were coming from honey. And over the course uh -huh. of a year, it was a full 15% of the calories in their diet. And at certain times of year, much higher than that, and even higher for the men who do most of the honey hunting because they eat quite a lot of it before they even come back into camp. So this is you know, a totally fascinating idea because when you put it in an evolutionary context, you ask then the question, well, would our ancestors living roughly the same lifestyle in the same landscape have done anything different? Well, probably not. The people today, the Hadza out there, are looking for honey on a daily basis. It's their favorite food. They're always searching for the, the hives of honeybees and at least six other honey-producing species in that area. And we know that chimpanzees eat honey and other great apes. So why not uh, Homo habilis and, and Homo erectus and even Australopithecus, mm -hmm. these ancient ancestors uh, who would have been in that same area looking for a sweet treat? And it becomes really powerful when you start to think about the impact of all those calories on ancestral humans because the story of human evolution has always been a story of brain size. And okay. the brain is what physiologists like to call uh, metabolically expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of energy <laughs> to run brain tissue. Fully, you know, 20% of our daily calories go to fuel the brain, which takes up, you know, only 2% or so of our body weight. So it is expensive to have a big brain. 
And every surge that we've seen in brain size over the eons of human evolution is thought to have been associated with a surge in, in calories, whether that be the advent of hunting or better tools uh, for hunting or uh, the advent of cooking, uh, which provides more calories from the food, more accessible calories. So when you start to look at honey in that context, well, honey is the most energy-rich food in nature. And not only that, but it comes in uh, large part in the form of glucose, which is what the brain uses. If you eat other things, your body will turn those starches or, or, or whatever into glucose to feed your brain, and you can get it straight out of honey. So mm. this suddenly suggests that our primordial sweet tooth led us to bees and to following them to honey and hives, and that the calories that we gain from that uh, may indeed have helped bolster increase in brain size over time. Because all of those same technological and social innovations that could lead to you know, increases in hunting productivity or increases in calories from cooking, whether it's stone tools... Uh, well, of course, those will allow you access into the the big hives of honeybees that are in trees. You can chop the tree open and get the honey. Well, mm -hmm. if you need to to master fire for cooking, well, that also gives you mastery over smoke, which you can use to pacify bees and get the honey. So there are all of these things now in the context of honey, which suggest it's, you know, perhaps not responsible for human evolution, but along with hunting and cooking and other innovations, a contributing factor uh, in what makes us who we are. Oh, this is so fascinating. Thank you so much, Tor. This has been really, really great to talk with you. Well, thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>